Guys, this is topic 5.6, and what we're looking at today is something called Rogers Characteristics of Innovation and Consumers. So there's really this guy named Everett Rogers, way back, I mean, way back in 1962, he wrote a book about how innovations get adopted by people, and he kind of broke it down into five characteristics that impact uh, the, ad the adoption of a particular innovation. And so um, they are relative advantage, compatibility, complexity, observability and trialability. So we're going to go through each of these uh, one by one. So here we go. Relative advantage. So what you're looking at with relative advantage is does the consumer see an advantage in a new innovation compared to an existing product? So um, a good example of that is washing machines. And in fact, if you click on this link, there's a whole article about it and you should click on this link and read it. And these are actually some of the washing machines from that article. And well, I mean, first of all, can you imagine doing your clothes by hand, the, the, the laboriousness, the amount of work that that takes to do your clothes by hand, that's washing them individually, um, using a washboard or, you know, even, you know, some people would just go down to the edge of a river and use rocks and things like that. So, um, you know, having a machine that actually washes your, your clothes for you was a huge advantage to start with. And um, these first came out back in the early 1900s, um, but this one's from about the 1940s. And, um, you know, it would wash your clothes, but then when you would want to um, spin or, you're not, you know, get the excess water out of the clothes for drying, you would use this thing right here, which it, you would feed your, your uh, clothes to this roller and hand roll them, okay? So, you know, it would wash your clothes, but to get them near dry or as close to dry as you could get them, um, you would put them through this roller first, okay? So there's the advantage of being uh, not having to wash them, but you have to wring them out. These are called wringers. Now... Um, a little while later, uh, I think this is from the 1960s, you have the same washing machine. You got So you can wash your clothes here. And then this was a spin dryer. So you would take your clothes from this bin and put it into there and then turn on the machine and it would spin the clothes and, you know, dry them for you. So the relative advantage is, you know, you don't have to do this by hand. You no longer have to crank this crank and roll your clothes through a, uh, a wringer to um, dry them out or to uh, squeeze out the excess water. And then, of course, in the 1970s, you've got this other type of washing machine, so similar idea, except this one has the washer and the spinner in the same um, machine. So you don't have to take the clothes out of one area, put it into another area. And so that was a, a, an advantage, right? So as, as you get new products and new um, innovations, uh, the, whether uh, somebody adopts them or not, depends on how advantageous it is for them. Um, I can think of this as far as in the old days, you'd have to turn a crank to roll up your windows in your car or roll down your windows. Um, now we have electric ones and, and then you have the electric ones where you can just push it once and it will roll all the way up or all the way down rather than having to hold it down. These are all like, you know, innovations that get adopted uh, because they're, they're advantageous for, for the consumer. Okay, the second, um, characteristic that we're going to talk about is compatibility. And so this is when you're looking at, does the new product depend on how well it aligns with the consumer's wants, needs, practices, and values? So, you know, a good example of this might be something like organic food versus GMO food. If you're the type of person who believes that all of your food should be very organic, then you would want to, you know, you're going to be, that's going to align with your values and your practice practices. If you don't care, then you might go for the GMO foods. Um, this can go for so many different things, right? Like there are people who are who are uh, trying to use less plastic. So you know somebody may choose to buy something or not buy something when it aligns with their values of of maybe less packaging or the type of packaging that it that it comes in. Is it coming in paper or is it coming in in um, you know plastic that that a ridiculous amount of pl plastic or something like that? So you know the compatibilities with your um, your values and practices will also um, it'll it'll uh, affect how you adopt an uh, an innovation. Okay, complexity. So what we're looking at here is you know depend the uh, adoption of the new product can depend on the perceived value of the pro product compared to the complexity of its use. So you know I put a couple of uh, and I mean this is pretty ancient history for you guys, but this is uh, the, from the 1980s and these are a couple of uh, computers. 
And so this is the Apple Lisa, and this is the Commodore 64. And, you know, the perceived value of using these two things because of their complexity was this was one of the first computers that actually had a mouse that you could point and click on things on the screen. Before that, or other computers at the time, this is the Commodore 64, you, you had no ability to use a, 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 a mouse. There is no mouse that was included in this computer. Basically, if you wanted to navigate around the screen, you'd have to use the arrows, um, you know, the uh, tab key, the, the return key, that kind of thing. And, and there, there was no point and click capability. So this is a much more complex computer to use and therefore didn't sell as well as the Apple computers, which were less complex. So complexity is going to affect how people adopt an innovation, right? More complex probably usually means less adoption. Less complex is usually meaning more adoption. And Apple has, has spent a lot of time and effort making sure that their, their products are, are less seemingly complex. Uh, so, you know, for instance, I just got a new Apple Watch and setting that thing up was, was really easy. I mean, it walks you through the men, menus. I mean, it's, it's a complex device, yet it seems simple. Okay, observability. So observability is the degree to uh, which the results of an innovation are visible. So really, this is about visibility. Can people see your innovation? You know, this is often a conspicuous consumption. You know, for, for example, the, um, uh, the Apple uh, I, or ear pods are an example of, of this, right? It's, a, it's a, an observable innovation that people are wearing, right? Um, the iWatch that I have is an observable innovation that people um, are wearing. This is kind of interesting. There was an article about this, uh, and it was happening in San Francisco, where um, in San Francisco, you want to put solar panels on the south side of your house. But if your house faces the street on the north side, so the north side of your house is facing the street, some people in San Francisco were putting solar panels on the north side of their house because they wanted people to see they wanted people to observe the innovation of having solar panels on top of their house. Um, that's again, it's something called conspicuous consumption. It's basically the idea that people see something, and it's it's sort of a sign of wealth, um, or you know, it's kind of cool to be an early adopter of, of technology. So it, it's kind of an interesting uh, um, fact. You know, they should put them on the side of the the house that's not facing towards the street, so on the on the back side of the house. But then nobody would see them. So you know, you don't have that same observability going on with it. So observability has something to do with people being able to see the technology. The more they can see it, the more that they'll adopt it. Okay, trialability. So trialability is, um, you know, the adoption of an innovation increase when people, when consumers have the ability to try the product. In other words, um, they can take it for a test drive, right? So that's what that's what test drives in a car are for. So you know, when you go to the Toyota dealership you can try out the car, right? You can try it, see if you like it, right? You can do the same thing at the Apple Store. So at the Apple Store, you'll see that there's all kinds of iPads and iPods and, and uh, um, cell phones that you can try out and, and take them for a test drive, see how you like it, see what, you know, if you like the look of them, the size of them, that kind of thing. You know, this is one of the biggest problems with shopping online has to do with trialability, that you can't really try things on until you get them. And then when you get them, you I mean, a lot of companies will allow you to return things really easily, but you know, if if uh, if they didn't allow you to return them, well, you know, you'd be stuck with what you got. This is a huge problem with clothes and and shoes. There's a company called Zappos which sells shoes in the states, and you can order shoes online, have them shipped to you. If you don't like them, you can just ship ship them right back for free, right? But that's that would be an important part of their business model because if they didn't allow you to try them on and return them they simply wouldn't be able to sell shoes. IKEA also does a good job of this, right? When you go to an IKEA store, you have, you know, the furniture set up, you can sit in it, you can, you know, move around, test things out and see if you like it before you buy it. So triability is a, 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 a important part of adopting an innovation. Okay. Lastly, we're going to talk about the social roots of consumerism and that's based on a few things. So this is based on uh, the groups a consumer identifies with will affect the adoption of, a, of an 
innovative products. So if you identify with a certain group, like for instance, let's say that you are a uh, kind of a techie person and you like to be one of those early adopters of things, well, you're going to identify with that group and that's going to affect how you adopt innovative products. You know, if you're somebody who's less uh, techie and, and a little more reticent to, to work with technology, you may not want to adopt things as quick or, or you just simply won't. Values that someone holds will affect the adoption of an uh, innovative product. So, you know, just, you know, an example here, people, there's a lot of groups around the world that are trying to um, create things like meatless hamburgers or uh, hamburgers or, or meat that's grown in a lab. Um, and, you know, somebody who's a, like a, a vegan and doesn't like the taste of meat, it doesn't matter whether that, that hamburger is made out of, of a vegetable matter. Uh, if, if they don't want to eat meat, they're probably not going to eat a um, one of those. Uh, I forget what they're called now. One of those um, burgers from from um, from Burger King or Fat Burger or um, that that are meatless, right? So if you hold the value that you just don't want to eat meat, then you probably won't eat meat or meat substitutes. Um, lifestyles, you know, how a person lives will affect the adoption of an, of an innovative product. So, for instance. You know, someone who is active is more likely to buy something like a Fitbit than someone who is less active, right? Um, so they're going to look at uh, that innovative project and decide whether they want to buy it because of the, the way that their lifestyle is. All right, that's it for me today, guys. We'll see you next time.